Yeah, thank you so much, Elke, for this lovely introduction, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to do this event with um, Sarah. Um, this is already our last session of, of this um, seminar, and um, be before we all get to say goodbye in about an hour or so, um, we, we've got um, time to take another angle on nature writing. And um, in one of the first sessions, um, Helen Moore said that um, Ted Hughes has got a monopoly on foxes. Um, <laughs> and um, I, would, I would like to return to that in, in this session, to come full circle somehow, um, together with Sarah Hall, who's sitting next to me. And um, we decided to, um, to use this session to talk about um, some foxes and wolf stories, mainly, um, and about how we, as humans, um, relate to these um, non-human creatures. And after that, there will be plenty of time to ask questions, but um, yeah, please try to save them for later. We, we, we will have time for that later. I first came in touch with um, Sarah's writing when I read an extract from her 2015 novel, The Wolf Border. And um, this extract featured in Granta's Best of Young British Novelists issue in 2013. Um, that's a very prestigious magazine anthology, if you don't know it yet, and I can only recommend that. Um, we were going to hear an extract from the novel later. When I first read Sarah, um, I immediately thought that this would be interesting material for scholarly analysis. As Elke said, I was um, living in London back then, working on a thesis on nature writing, and I was interested, and still Im am interested, in all types of um, literary depictions of, of nature. Um, and um, in, in Sarah's work, there's um, so much to discover. It's such rich soil um, for um, eco-critics and um, for all people interested in non-human realities. There are um, birds, plants, and <laughs> even whole ecosystems. Um, her stories abound in animals, and um, often these are so-called companion species. I found that quite interesting. Um, there are, for instance, dying horses, there are dogs, um, there are bees, and um, so, so these are animals most humans seem to be quite familiar with. Um, humans are likewise often portrayed with regard to their animalistic instincts what essentially comes down to sex and uh, some other things. <laughs> um, Sarah Hall was born in Cumbria, um, and the North is also the background against which many of her stories are set. This may or may not include Mrs. Fox, the first story in Sarah's most recent short story collection, Madame Zero. The location is a sub suburban commuter town, presumably on the margins of a larger city that grows and grows into the surrounding landscape. The story re revolves around a couple in the modern world, where he or she cooks, both are busy with their jobs, and there are no children yet. And then something happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shall I read? <laughs> Please. Okay. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, and uh, I feel lucky. I'm the one that gets to read here. Somehow it feels special. Uh, one morning he wakes to find his wife vomiting into the toilet. She is kneeling, retching, but nothing is coming up. She is holding the bowl. As she leans forward, the notches in her spine rise against the flesh of her back. Her protruding bones, the wide open mouth, a clicking sound in her gullet. The scene is disconcerting. His wife is almost never ill. He touches her shoulder. Are you all right? Can I do anything? She turns. Her eyes are bright, the brightness of fever. There's a coppery gleam under her skin. She shakes her head. Whatever is rising in her has passed. She closes the lid, flushes, and stands. She leans over the sink and drinks from the tap, 
not sips, but long sucks of water. She dries her mouth on a towel. I'm fine. She lays a hand briefly on his chest, then moves past him to the bedroom. She begins to dress, zips up her skirt, fits her heels into the backs of her shoes. I won't have breakfast. I'll get something later. See you tonight. She kisses him goodbye. Her breath is slightly sour. He hears the front door slam and the car engine start. His wife has a strong constitution. She does not often take to her bed. In the year they met, she had some kind of mass removed through an opened abdomen. She got up and walked the hospital corridors the same day. He goes into the kitchen and cooks an egg, and then he too leaves for work. Later, he will wonder, and through the day he worries. But that evening, when they return to the house, will herald only good things. She seems well again, radiant even, having signed a new contract at work for the sale of a block of satellite offices. The greenish hue to her skin is gone. Her hair is undone and all about her shoulders. She pulls him forward by the tie. Thank you for being so sweet this morning. They kiss. He feels relief, but over what, he's not sure. He untucks her blouse, slips his fingers under the waistband of her skirt. She indicates her willingness. They move upstairs and reduce each other to nakedness. He bends before her, a wide badge of hair, undepilated, spreads at the top of her thighs. The taste reminds him of a river. They take longer than usual. He is strung between immense climactic pleasure and delay. She does not come, but she is ardent, and finally, he cannot hold back. They eat late, cereal in bed, spilling milk from the edges of the bowls like children. They laugh at the small domestic adventure. It's as if they've just met. Tomorrow is the weekend when time becomes luxurious. But his wife does not sleep late, as she usually would. When he wakes, she is already up in the bathroom. There's the sound of running water, and under its flow, another sound. The low cry of someone expressing injury, a burn or a cut, a cry like a bird, but wider of throat. Once, twice, he hears it. Is she sick again? He knocks on the door. Sophia! She doesn't answer. She is a private woman. This is her business. Perhaps she's fighting a flu. He goes to the kitchen to make coffee. Soon she joins him. She has bathed and dressed, but does not look well. Her face is pinched, dark around the eye sockets, markedly so, as if an overnight gauntening has taken place. Oh, poor you, he says. What would you like to do today? We can stay here and take it easy if you don't feel well. Walk, she says. I'd like some air. He makes toast for her, but she takes only a bite or two. He notices that the last chewed mouthful has been put back on her plate, a damp little brown pile. She keeps looking towards the window. Would you like to go for a walk now, he asks. She nods and stands. At the back door, she pulls on leather boots, a coat, a yellow scarf, and moves restlessly while he finds his jacket. They walk through the cul-de-sac, ringed by Kaluna houses, past the children's play area at the end of the road, the concrete pit with conical mounds where children skate. It's still early, no one's around. Intimations of frost under north-facing gables. Behind the morning mist, a faint October sun has begun its industry. They walk through a gateway onto scrubland, then into diminutive trees, young ash recently planted around the skirt of the older woods. Two miles away, on the other side of the heath towards the city, bulldozers are levelling the earth, extending the road system. Sophia walks quickly on the dirt path, perhaps trying to walk away the virus, the malaise, whatever it is that's upsetting her system. The path rises and falls, chicanes permissively. There are ferns and grasses, twigs angling up, leaf spoils, the brittle memory of wild garlic and summer flowers. Towards the centre, a few older trees have survived, their branches heavy, 
their bark flaking, trunks starred with orange lichen. Birds dip and dart between bushes. The light breaks through, a gilded light, terrestrial, but somehow holy. She moves ahead. They do not speak, but it is not uncompanionable. He allows himself for a few moments to be troubled by irrational thoughts. She has a rapid, senseless cancer and will waste. There will be unconscionable pain. He will hold a fatal vigil beside her bed. Outliving her will be dire. Her memory will be like a wound in him. But as he watches her stride in front, he can see that she's fit and healthy. Her body swings, full of energy. What is it then? An unhappiness? A confliction? He dares not ask. The woods begin to thicken, oak and beech. A jay flaps across the thicket, lands on the ground nearby. He admires the primary blue elbow before it flutters off. Sophia turns her head sharply in the direction of its flight. She picks up her pace and begins to walk strangely on the tips of her toes, her knees bent, her heels lifted. Then she leans forward and in a keen, awkward position begins to run. She runs hard. Her feet toss up fragments of turf and flares of leaves. Her hair gleams. The chromic sun renders it livid. She runs at full tilt, as if pursued. Hey, he calls. Hey, stop. Where are you going? Fifty yards away, she slows and stops. She crouches on the path as he hurries after her, her body twitching in an effort to remain still. He catches up. What was all that about, darling? She turns her head and smiles. Something is wrong with her face. The bones have been recarved. Her lips are thin, and her nose is a dark blade. Teeth small and yellow. The lashes of her hazel eyes have thickened, and her brows are drawn together. An expression he has never seen before. A look that is almost craven. A trick of kiltering light on this English autumn morning, the deep cast of shadows from the canopy. He blinks. She turns to face the forest again. She is leaning forward, putting her hands down, lifting her bottom. She has stepped out of her laced boots and is walking away. Now she is running again on all fours, lower to earth, sleeker, fleeter. She is running and becoming smaller, running and becoming smaller, running in the light of the reddening sun, the red of her hair and her coat falling, the red of her fur and her body loosening, running. Holding behind her a sudden, brazen object, white-tipped. Her yellow scarf trails in the briar, all vestiges shed. She stops within calling distance, were he not struck dumb. She looks over her shoulder, topaz eyes glinting, scorched face, vixen. October light, no less duplicitous than any seasons. Birds calling, plants shriveling. The moon, palely bent on the horizon, is setting. Everything swift or slow continues. He looks at the fox on the path in front of him. Any moment, his wife will walk between the bushes. She will crawl out of the wen of woven ferns. The undergrowth, which must surely have taken her, will yield her back. How amazing, she'll whisper, pointing up the track. These are his thoughts, standing in the morning sun, staring and wrestling belief. Insects pass from stalk to stalk. The breeze through the trees is sibilant. On the path, looking back at him, is a brilliant creature which does not move off, does not flinch or sidle. No. She turns fully and hoists the tail around beside her like a flaming scepter. Slim limbs and slender nose, a badge of white from jaw to breast. Her head thrust low and forward as if she is looking along the earth into the future. His mind's a shock of useless thought, denying, hectoring, until one lone voice proceeds through the chaos. You saw, you saw, you saw. He says half words, nothing sensible. 
And now she trots towards him down the path as a dog would, returning to its master. Nerve and instinct, her thousand feral programs, should she not flee into the borders, kicking away the man-made world? She comes to him, her coy, sporting body held on elegant, black-socked legs. A moment ago, Sophia. He stands still. His mind stops exchanging. At his feet, she sits, her tail rearing, exceptional winged ears, eyes like the spectrum of her blended fur. He kneels and with absolute tenderness touches the ruff of her neck, which would be soft were it not for the light tallowing of hairs. What can be decided in a few moments that will not be questioned for a lifetime? He collects her coat from the nearby bushes. He moves to place it gently around her. She does not resist. And his arms reaching cautiously under, he lifts her. The moderate weight of a mid-sized mammal. The scent of musk, gland, and faintly, faintly, her perfume, a dirty rose. And still, in the woods and on the apron of grassland, no one is hiking, though soon there will be dogs tugging against leads, old couples, children gadding about. Down the path he walks, holding his fox. Her brightness escapes the coat at both ends. It is like trying to wrap fire. Her warmth against his chest is astonishing for a wife who always felt cold in her hands and feet. She is calm. She does not struggle, and he bears her like a sacrifice, a forest pieta. Half a mile in secret view, past the sapling ash trees, through the heath gate, past the concrete pit where one sole girl is turning tricks on her board, practicing before the boys come, her gaze held down over the front wheels. There are the houses, new builds, each spanking, chimneyless, their garages closed, and he must walk the gauntlet of suburbia, his heart founding a terrible rhythm at the thought of doors opening, blinds being lifted, exposure. Somewhere nearby, a car door slams. She shifts in his arms and his grip tightens. Around the bend, he ignores the distracted neighbor who is moving a bin. Up the pathway to number 34, she is heavier now, deadening his muscles. He moves her to the crux of his left arm, reaches into his trouser pocket for the keys, fumbles, drops them, bends down. She, thinking he is releasing her perhaps, begins to wriggle and scramble towards the ground, but he keeps her held in his aching arm. He lifts the keys from the flagstones, opens the door and enters. He closes the door behind and all the world is shut out. And suddenly, his rescuer's strength goes. His arms give. Sensing it, she jumps, her back leg, her back claws raking his forearm. She lands sheerly on the carpet. She holds still a second or two, shakes, then goes into the kitchen directly, no investigation of location, and jumps onto a chair next to the table. As if now, after her walk and purging of the disease of being human, she is ready for breakfast. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> My first question is a very short one. <laughs> Why a fox? Why a fox? Um, well, I suppose because if you live in a town or a city in Britain, the chances of seeing a fox are mm. pretty high. Uh, there are a lot around urban foxes. And, and really, it's always quite surprising, even though we might be used to them now. Um, because they're reasonably big and, you know... <sighs> British animals have <laughs> shrunk, and um, they seem sort of fewer and farther between. Uh, and when foxes are seen in the city, it, it is still it is still quite remarkable. You know the colour, uh, the size of them, uh, but you are likely to see them. So it seemed like the right creature for many ways, and also it's a it's a it's a vivid looking creature. So it, it's sort of representational of a lot of different things if you want it to be. Yeah, I thought so too. That's one of the few wild animals that you actually see quite often in, mm -hmm. in a city, right? Um, now, you describe a transformation from 
human being into fox, and um, there's quite a long literary tradition of um, tran such transformation stories. Um, but um, what strikes me as unique in your story is that um, um, other storytellers like um, Kafka in the Met Metamorphosis, um, we um, we find Gregor Samsa already having been transformed at the beginning of the story, or um, in David Garner's Lady and Two Fox, yeah. which tells a very yeah. similar story as you. Um, and which the short story is based loosely on. Yes. Um, he um, does the transformation in just a couple of sentences, yeah. so the supernatural event is somehow condensed in, in two sentences mm -hmm. or so, and yours seem, seems to be a different approach. It is, yeah, yeah. But, and then she turned into a fox. Um, but I suppose I, I sp I've always attempted a fairly sort of hyper-real way of description anyway for everything. But also, we live in an age of cinema uh, and, and film and, and uh, uh, visual kind of <laughs> tricks, I suppose. Um, and in some ways, the challenge is to convince the reader uh, beyond just one sentence, which which says she turned into a fox, um, uh, and I quite like that challenge. I, I started the story, and I knew I was looking forward to getting to that point. How how to fix it? How to convince? What what can you do? Um, so visually, you know, there needs to there needs to be some kind of visual sign of her changing, uh, and that's a challenge for descriptive writing. But also. I've always been interested in poetry and language, and, and I don't see that as, as separate from prose. And I think uh, there are there are ways of handling language that that can help uh, bring the reader to a, a kind of different place. So whether it's just a, a trance method, a kind of a level of language which seems incantatory. So that's what that passage attempts to do: the repetition in it, the length of the sentence. Mm. It's kind of, you know, if you build something within the language, often you can help move the reader into a, into a different state where they are ready to receive something mystical or mythical or un unusual or uncanny. Uh, and that's why that passage reads the way it does. Yeah, I felt when you just read it um, that rhythm is also very important for this um, transformation, how you repeat it running and running, and yeah. um, sh you actually get to do the path, yeah. the transformation path, together yeah. with yeah. Um, Sophia. That's right. And I was thinking, I suppose, in many ways, I was thinking about Cormac McCarthy and his writing. For a start, you know, he describes animals brilliantly, and there is, it is very difficult to describe animals uh, in fiction, in prose, in non-fiction, you know, it's just very difficult to kind of visually des describe them well. The same with human beings, of course. Uh, you can run into all kinds of descriptive problems, but uh, McCarthy is able to do it superbly, but also understands the kind of power of, the, uh, power of incantatory language in prose. And I don't think you come across it all that often in prose, but he handles it very well. For example, The End of Blood Meridian, if anybody's read that novel, has this horrifying ending uh, where, uh, w without wanting to spoil it for anyone who hasn't read the book, uh, it's a stretch of prose that, that, does, that does something t to the ear and then the brain and the, the imagination, and you, are, you begin to be filled with horror to the point where you become convinced that the devil's in the room with you. It's an extraordinary stretch of prose, and I sort of took this as a, uh, as a sort of, not, not, didn't want to borrow the ambition of it, but I wanted to mm. think about doing something similar, really. In our writing workshop earlier this morning, you said that poetry and prose is not really that divorced for you. You mm. see it as um, going together. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, you might be putting more sentences down on the page, but. Um, you know, and economies of language might be slightly different, world building might be slightly different, but uh, the, the power of, of language and its musicality and it, its um, emphasis and its structures remain similar, remain the same in some ways. Mm. Uh, so I've, I've never seen anything wrong with writing rhyming sentences in a novel. <laughs> <laughs> Many other people have, but... <laughs> I would like to talk a bit about the moment of transformation and what means m maybe with regard to human-animal relations. Um, because on the one hand, it seems like a moment of alienation, of um, mm. husband and wife um, <laughs> going different ways. Yeah. Um, um, on the other hand, um, in your story, um, 
I found the role of the husband quite interesting. It's very interesting. He, um, maybe you can talk a bit uh, for, for the people who yeah. haven't read the story. And in the original novella, her. Lady into Fox, as well, it's mm. very interesting. Uh, the idea that complete alienation doesn't doesn't happen. The, the the husband tries to live with the the wife who's changed into a fox, and and there are children involved. There are kind of fox. There's a litter of foxes involved. Uh, and I hadn't read the novella. I knew the story of it. I knew the plot points of it when I started writing the story, which I think was helpful um, because I wasn't mm. trying to copy or, or anything else. I was just using it as a sort of calc form. Um, but that was fascinating to me. The idea that um, how do you how do you live with wildness? This has always interested me. The idea of the kind of wild inside the animalistic quality of the human being, and how do you how do you bring that close? How do you begin to try to live with it? And I wanted to explore that a bit. And of course, it's impossible in some ways. You lose language or you learn new languages. Helen was. McDonald was talking very interestingly about, you know, uh, f finding ways of communication between human and animal, and that is very interesting. Um, it was interesting about the original novella, and I wanted to explore it in the story. So there is alienation, but there's also a sense of connect connectivity be between the two things, and trying to find a way. S the character of Sophia, you don't know much about her in the, the short story, other than that she's working in real estate, and that might somehow and. They're living in an area where the heath is be is under pressure, mm. you know. So the wildlife is being lost on the heath, which is a common story in Britain and probably across Europe. That the, you know the the battle between expansion of city and town and loss of countryside, loss of the rural. So she might, in some ways, be involved with the heath being lost um, and new development happening. And I almost wanted to explore how we are all somehow cul culpable. In the in the way that the countryside is being reconstituted, even as we fight against that, uh, and the idea of if you lose that connection with it, you're losing something in yourself. What is it about wild spaces that we need that somehow allow us to come home? You know, mm. I mean, I was brought up in the Lake District, so which is semi-wild at best. It's as a child, I considered it wild. I thought it was wild. You know, I was brought up to think it was wild. There it's are lots of tourists now. Lots of tourists now. <laughs> you know, it's sort of, it's fringe wild. You know, there are uh, semi-wild fell ponies, less now than there were when I was a child, uh, which were sort of free roaming, although they were owned by someone. And there was this, there was this kind of sense of, okay, you know, and a golden eagle, the, the, the only pair of golden eagles in England, um, in our valley. And so it, it, there was a sense of the wild was there, it was just there, and it's an area that you know bears the weight of the kind of romantic movement, uh, romantic writers and artists, so there is a sense that uh, an examination of, of mm. landscape has, has happened and has defined that territory, which is interesting for a contemporary writer to think about. Uh, so I've always wanted to, you know, I've always felt like I was right at the border of what, once I began to understand that it wasn't wild, you know. Mm. Uh, it wasn't wild, it was sheep farmed and, and, and managed. Um, and yes, people would fall off mountains and die often uh, because they weren't wearing the right clothing, or they even were, but a storm had come in. It was wild, but it wasn't wild. Right at the border of that, it, it's a great point to stand because then you're working between borders and territories, you're working between cultivation, civilization, and wilderness and wild. And that relationship is really important and I think is being lost but is still very important in the psychology of, of, any, of any place, really. Mm. We're going to get to the Lake District in a bit. I just want to stick with um, Mrs. Fox for a little bit longer, um, beca um, because um, the... Um, sorry, <laughs> I lost my thread. Um, the, I, I think maybe we could also see the, the, the wild as being situated within um, the human body. I found that very interesting in the story, um, because at first when I read the story, I thought maybe Sophia was pregnant, and she turned out to be pregnant, but as a fox then later. And um, I'm wondering, um, pregnancy seems to play quite an important role in your work, and um, is, already, uh, is also... Um, a transformation. Mm. The human body is being transformed, and it's also c kind of a wildness within the human body. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's yes. You, you know, she's throwing up in the morning. It's yeah. it's, it's uh, she she could be and is pregnant. Um, 
Uh, and, so those, and those two things kind of come together quite neatly, this like kind of full transition into animal, but also the idea that pregnancy might be a state where uh, things do feel slightly out of control in the body. You know, something mm. is rapidly growing, there are all these sensations, and, and it, it, it is slight, feels animalistic in some ways to the point of the birth, which, you know, uh, I had a C-section, so I don't know, I was unconscious, but... <laughs> Um, yes, I do think it's a, it's, a, it's a human state that in some ways allows us to, to think more about animal qualities within ourselves somehow. But do and you think that renders women closer to nature in a way? The, the I mean, I don't know. Does uh, uh, Possibly that experience does. Um, we could ask whether violence sort of, you know, are, are men more violent? Does that sort of bring them closer to a kind of wildness in other ways? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. But these areas where that might be happening a little more, sex, another one, it's a kind of, you know, a, a state of you, so much human transaction going on, but also something physical and that might take you away from your kind of civilized human identity that you think mm. you possess. These are areas that I'm very interested in, the, the kind of points where you're shedding your kind of humanness, or at least you're or expanding it, or you're kind of allowing something other to kind of exist. We, we spend so much time, you know, trying to be civilized and trying to lay down regulation, and and always the sort of the the most dramatic points in life are where a birth, death, you know, these things that are kind of completely unmoor us from mm. from ways of understanding ourselves or feeling in control, I suppose. Not to say that the natural world is not in control of itself. Mm. You know, there are systems of control that are very interesting, but it's just a different state. It's a different state. Mm. In the wolf border, um, we have both death and birth and wolves. <laughs> um, the, the novel describes um, how um, the female protagonist, Rachel, after the death of her mother, returns to Cumbria. Um, Rachel has worked in a wolf reservation in Idaho before, um, and um, she's then invited by an, the, the Earl of Annadale to um, take part in a um, project to reintroduce wolves to um, the British island. And um, Rachel agrees and comes back to the Lake District. Um, everything goes well, the wolves breed. Rachel herself gives birth to a baby boy. She reconnects with her brother, and then someone lets the wolves out. Um, and um, yeah, would you like to I, read? I will. A yeah, from certainly. The book? Yeah, so that's <laughs> a very neat summary of where we are in the in the book. Uh, and uh, as I said the other day, you can't really set up a novel with a wolf enclosure without actually letting the wolves out at that <laughs> point. So it's sort of relatively predictable, but uh, never mind. Yeah. So at this stage of the novel, uh, Rachel has been unable to find childcare for her son. Uh, so has. She's having to bring him along while tracking the escaped wolves, which is a sort of amplified version. I think a lot of women feel this way. If you, if you can't quite get childcare for something and you have to bring your child with you to a work event, this, <laughs> this is sort of an impossible... There's an impossibility to the whole thing that you have to somehow navigate. Anyway, this is an amplified version of that, really. Um, uh, so she and her infant son have been camping in the car. She's, the wolves um, are radio tagged, they have um, uh, a chip so she can, she can follow them uh, on the transmitters and she has tracked them through a forest, uh, lost them again and is trying to reconnect. Um, at this point the police in the county are involved so there's a big, th the big scenario of the escaped animal uh, being tracked everyone's on it, basically, but she's trying to stay ahead of the game. Dawn wakes her, cold legs and stiffness through her back. The car is cool inside and the door moulding feels damp with condensation, but against her side, Charlie is a little engine of heat. The windows have misted with their breathing. She wipes the nearest one, looks out at the misty citrine light filtering through the woods. Small flocks of birds break above the canopy and disperse. She reaches onto the parcel shelf for the handheld tracker and switches it on. The battery is on half charge, there's no signal. She switches to Ra's frequency, but it's the same. They have moved on. 
She slides carefully from underneath Charlie, inch by inch, as if he's a bomb she doesn't want to detonate, and lays him flat on the back seat in the blankets. He stirs, but doesn't wake. Several times in the night, he came round, confused, and she had to coax him to slumber again. She opens the car door quietly and gets out, stretches, walks about. The air feels newly laundered, fresh and green. She eats a banana, walks about to find reception and calls the police number on the card given to her by Sergeant Armstrong, asks to be put through to the officer manning the inquiry. There have been no more reported sightings. She opens the OS map fully and lays it flat on the dewy ground, charts the position from Annadale to the point in the Galt where the signal was strongest, the Galt is the forest, where the signal was strongest, then continues the trajectory on into farmland and the hills beyond. Their tendency to travel in straight lines might help her find them. There are few settlements on the other side of the Galt, mostly small lanes and B roads, until the A66 and the town of Cockermouth. After that, they will have to traverse Bassenthwaite and the northwestern fells. The rural tracts between towns will suit them, might give them cover. They will continue through Greystoke and Hutton towards the border and Carlisle, the county's only city. At the Solway Firth, they would be forced to follow the estuary inland and cross by road where the water narrows, or perhaps at a shallow swim. Then, Scotland. She plots a route on the closest roads, waits for the wandering phone reception and texts Lawrence, gives him a rendezvous point to meet and pick up Charlie. He is already up and texts back there in one hour. It's an ambitious timescale, almost heroic. If he makes it, he will not have observed the speed limit. She hears Charlie murmuring sleepily and lifts him out of the car, hugs him and talks quietly to him. He's clingy in the morning these days. She wipes his crusty nose, gives him some formula and changes him. She walks him around for a few minutes. He's still unsure on his feet, likes to make stumbling rushes towards her, then collapse into her arms. She tries not to hurry him. She will need cooperation for the ordeal of the car seat. They examine some notable things on the verge, curling bracken, a puffball, which she sets smoking with her foot, some spindling toadstools. After ten minutes, they set off along the bumpy forestry road. It's a brilliant October day, with a flawless sky. The summit of Galt Fell rises behind her, the north face of its crags dark and fissured. Charlie begins an invented song, a tuneless string of noise with emphatic peaks and murmuring rests. He's in a good mood. He likes travelling. He reminds her of Kyle that way. She begins to feel hopeful. Perhaps it will all work out. She keeps the receiver next to her on the passenger seat. The ruts begin to even out, and she picks up speed. At the Forestry Commission gate, there's an official warning sign set up. Danger, please do not enter. Too late, she thinks. The car breaks free of the trees. She turns onto the road and heads into rolling pasture land, a stretch of fallow fields surrounded by dry stone walls. The receiver begins to sound. She notes the coordinates. She keeps checking the map follows a series of single lanes, lonnings that all look the same, webbed with brambles on either side. As she passes a gate, she notices three horses gathered in the corner of a field. She stops and reverses, looks through the wooden bars. The creatures are visibly upset. Their heads nod up and down, and they push against each other and vie for wall space. One rears up, the white crescent cupping its dark eye. Something has spooked them, and not long ago. She dials Sergeant Armstrong's number, but does not get through, then drives on. When her phone rings, she pulls over. Morning, Rachel. I was on the other line. Where are you? Near Priest's Mill, I think. I might be close to them. We need to think about getting them back to the estate if I can dart them. The sedatives take about two hours. OK, listen. We just had a call from a farmer at Meyer Hall Farm. He says one of his dogs was going crazy this morning, barking and growling, and when he went to investigate, he saw one of the wolves in the field where his sheep are. Sheep are, sorry. <laughs> There's a pause, and her mood of levity begins to fade. She knows what's coming. Charlie is burbling louder, singing away, fighting for her attention now that she's on the phone. Hush, hush, darling, she says over her shoulder. I'm afraid he fired off a shot, Sergeant Armstrong says. What? 
He fired at it. Did he kill it? She asks. Well, he says it's not in the field anymore. He thought he hit it. How he described it is its back end sort of dropped to the ground, but then it ran off. Bastard, she thinks. Not even a clean shot. She wonders which is the unfortunate one, possibly a juvenile opportunistically trying its luck with the flock. Any other information? Size, markings? No, I'm sorry. The farm's about four miles from Priest's Mill. Are you near there now? I think so. Maya Hall, you say? Yeah, the farmer's name is Jim Corrigan. We're sending someone out, but I thought you'd want to know. We've told him not to go looking for it in case it's injured. Good, I'll go there now. She hangs up, grips the wheel tightly for a moment. Charlie is still burbling. She looks at him in the rearview mirror. She checks the signals from Merle and Ra's transmitters. They are still in the area, have not moved far. She won't know whether it's one of them until she finds the pack or a body. Mama, Charlie says. Yes, Mama, yes. She tries to think positively. Nothing has been confirmed yet. The dropped rear might have been a cowering flinch, a reaction to the noise of the shotgun. She checks the map, finds the farm, turns the car around in the next gateway and sets off. She stops again almost immediately and calls Alexander. It's still early. The conference in Belfast will not have begun yet. He picks up straight away. Everyone, it seems, is on standby. Briefly, she fills him in. I haven't got the means, she says, if it's badly hurt. I've only got the dart case. I know someone in practice round there, he tells her. I'll call and let her know what's happening. She's good. She'll take care of it. Are you okay, Rachel? Are you out there by yourself? Yeah, I'm okay. Just pissed off. <sighs> Have you spoken to Thomas? It sounds like you could use some help. Not yet. Maybe call him. I will. Charlie, who has been fussing for the last few minutes for her attention, begins to wail. Is that Charlie? Yeah, Lawrence is on his way to get him. I've got to go. OK, he says. Let me know how it pans out. I'll call Justine and give her your number. Rachel, don't do anything crazy. Like? Just take care. She finds the farm, a dirty, whitewashed building in a courtyard of dilapidated barns and asbestos sheds. A dog is barking inside one of the bothies, slurry and spilt straw on the cobbles as she pulls up. She half expects to see the wolf strung up from a hook, but there are only farm vehicles, a rusting tractor, an ancient threshing machine, an agricultural reliquary. A scruffy herd of sheep is penned inside a wooden enclosure, their fleeces trail in need of shearing. In the window of the farmhouse is an anti-Europe poster left over from the by-election. She leaves Charlie in the car, which he is not happy about, writhing and shouting, and she knocks on the front door. She tries to dismiss her preconceptions, but the man who answers is latched, faced, suspicious and rude, an old-school Cumbrian belligerent. At first, he does not believe her. She's not the police, and he is expecting the police. How does she know about the wolf? Is she a reporter? She tells him again who she is, who she works for, that she is here to track and recapture the pack. He tuts and frowns. She asks which direction the one in the field headed. He points to a nearby copse standing half a mile away on the horizon. Up there, they say not to go. Fucking thing was in on my ewes. Had one of them dangling by the neck. You should see the state of it. Where is it, she asks. Do you want to show me? It's in the rain, she says. It's been incinerated. Of course it has, she thinks. She holds her tongue, nods. He is angry, aggrieved. He seems also pleased. But then he shot a wolf, an escaped wolf. He will dine out on the fact for years, retelling the story in the pub for a free pint. Are you a reporter, he asks again. No, I'm not. She makes her way back to the car. Charlie is howling, his eyes screwed tightly shut and streaming wet, his fists clenched, furious at being abandoned. She opens the back door and the whale escapes, ringing around the courtyard. She hushes him, but does not release him from the car seat. The man's watching from the farm doorway, scowling. A crying baby in her possession, sinister proof that she is not who she says she is. They said not to go up there, he calls. It's a big fucker. She gets into the driver's seat and pulls away up the slippery cobbles. The petrol light has come on, less than a quarter of a tank. She heads towards the copse, finds a gateway, clearing a few hundred yards from the, a few hundred yards from the farm, and parks the Saab. 
She gets Charlie out, soothes him, puts him in the last clean nappy. He is developing a rash, gives him some fruit and a jar of baby food. He struggles a little as she attaches him in the papoose. He's reaching the end of his tether, needs to get back to normality, or there will be a huge meltdown, but she cannot let the creature suffer if it is suffering. She takes the dart case out of the boot and her binoculars, checks the handheld receiver, climbs the stile into the field, and walks towards the copse. The signal is strong. They are within close range, perhaps hesitating over the wounded member of the pack. If the bullet is in the hind area, the animal might have limped a mile or two at best, and she will have to crisscross the field and woods to find it, or get back in the car and wait for the police searchers. There's a slim chance that it could be darted, then taken to the local vet and saved, but she doubts it. If it's been hit anywhere critical, it'll be lucky to have come further than the top of the paddock. She makes her way uphill, scanning the area. The grass is empty, rutted and hummocked here and there, lost walls of dirty wool caught on the stalks. Charlie swings his legs, more content to be on the move and outside again, but it will not last. The copse is sparse, once part of the greater Galt Forest, now a denuded cluster of trees, an island stranded in farmland. In the treetops, a few solicitous black crows caw, hopping down the branches, cautiously peering below, then hopping back up again. It's here, she thinks. She checks the receiver again. The signal is still strong. They are very close, unseen. She moves carefully, searching for tracks in the softer earth, single paw prints, a spattering of dark blood. She turns and looks back at the farm, which is clearly visible, a huddle of pens, low chimneys and a bowed roof. Jim Corrigan will have watched the animal's departure, might even have fired more shots at it as it took off, just to be sure. She begins to circle the copse, keeping back a reasonable distance, trying to separate the undergrowth from a camouflaged body. She makes a full circuit of the trees, moves in closer and begins again. She sees it, 30 feet away. It is lying on its side, unmoving, head tucked down, legs straight and stiff. The paler of the male juveniles. Its ruff is indistinguishable against the pale birches. It looks dead. It has only just made cover, will have limped painfully to a spot where it might be hidden. She retreats a few paces, kneels and sets down the aluminium case. She lifts Charlie out of the papoose and puts him in a deep swale of grass, facing back down the hill towards the forest. Look at the pretty colours, she says, so pretty, red and yellow and orange. But he looks all around at the field, at her. Mama, yes, Mama. Yes. She gives him another piece of fruit. While he is distracted, she steps back over the case, opens it and loads the gun with a dart. She picks up the case and approaches the wolf, glancing back at Charlie. She inhales, exhales, thinks of her instructions to the Chief Joseph volunteers every year. Do everything calmly, do everything confidently. The animal does not lift its head or stir, but its side moves very slightly, up and down, still breathing. She turns to look at Charlie again and to scan the vicinity. Only the top of his head is visible, a burr of black hair in the depression. He is secluded by the grass, like a leveret inside its form. She continues towards the animal. There's not much blood on the ground, but the honey fur is stained along the torso and back legs. The trauma is to the side of the lower abdomen, likely always fatal. There's no time to save it or call Alexander's colleague. Even fresh, the best surgeon would have struggled. There are tread marks in the earth around the animal and flattened grass it has been turning, probably licking itself, trying to bite out whatever is lodged. She leans over the body. The eye is open, pale and bright in the sunlight, the pupil a small dark point. The jaw is slack, the black pleats drawn back over its teeth. Just enough life left to growl, its eye rolls a fraction, the muzzle ripples upward, but it can do no more. She aims and fires the dart. The muscle barely flinches as it hits. She fits another dart and fires again. The drug will only hasten what is inevitable, and it is perhaps a waste, but she will not leave the animal like this. The eye closes to a black slit. She squats down, looks properly. The coat is blended and tawny, thickening for winter. 
It's better that he remained unnamed, she thinks, though the loss is the same, with or without. She puts her hand on the warm head, moves it down the body, parts the matted fur to find the red os of the entry wound. The feeling isn't anger, just disgust. It's a pointless waste. She takes her phone from her back pocket and switches to camera setting. She will leave it to the police to remove the corpse, but the image might go to work for them now and help the others, horrible and unnecessary as the death is. The crows clamor above her. She is invading. They've guarded the prize and want it back. From the paddock, she hears a thin wail. She rights herself and walks towards Charlie. He's standing up in the hollow, looking at the cops, his head and shoulders unburrowed. He is trying to climb up, but the sides are too steep and he cannot get traction. For a second, she expects to see Merle appear behind him, pick him up, the straps of his dungarees clasped between her teeth and carry him off, her abandoned, beloved son. The vision is so clear that she almost panics, almost shouts. His cries carry across the field. The pasture is empty. The sky is enormous above him. The wolves are watching or have already gone. She walks quickly to him, saying his name, telling him she is coming, everything is okay, it's okay, it's okay. She kneels at the edge of the hollow and takes the packet of baby wipes out of the papoose pocket and cleans the blood off her hands. And then she lifts him up and kisses him, holds him tightly. He won't remember this, she thinks. He won't really think it happened. Thank you. You already said that mothers sometimes have to bring their children to work or to places because they don't find someone to take care of them during this time. And, but I was wondering why you, as a novelist, decided that Rachel brings along her child in this, um, during this hunt. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, partly for the dramatic purposes towards the end, you know, that clear and ruthless decision that you make as a novelist to ramp things up at the end. But also, things have been set up that way. I mean, um, when the Earl first builds this enclosure, there's lots of protests from the villagers in the area. Uh, and one of the complaints that's made is, these wolves are going to get out and kill our children. And the Earl says this extraordinary thing, you know, he's very cocksure, and he, he replies um, to, this, to the woman who, who accuses him of this, creating this danger for their children. You know, you could leave a baby in the enclosure and it would be fine. You know, and I wrote this down, and then at the time I was like, oh, right, okay, well, that's set something up for later, and I know that, I know, I know that something is going to happen, that, that a child will be left near the wolves, and it will be fine, because generally that would be fine. Um, but so it's, it was really about, um, you know, the novel is in some ways tr not trying to reach an understanding about wolves, but uh, trying to overturn a lot of the kind of myths and the misunderstandings around them, which lead to this kind of conflicted opinion about them, about whether they're dangerous to humans. And I think it also introduces an element of humour. It's quite... A, it, it's a bit... Humour? Yeah, I <laughs> <What>? think so. <laughs> great. <laughs> that was <Did> accidental. <laughs> yeah, uh, great. <laughs> I mean, imagine it as a film, Rachel changing diapers. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. sh while yeah, shooting the wolf. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nicholas Cage and Holly Hunter. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. As well, I mean, I, I don't think I think in, in terms of sort of comedic, um, sorry, punchlines. But um, great, sorry. <laughs> um, when the wolves break free, they um, they go north, further north, and they go towards Scotland. And um, maybe we should talk about that a bit because um, the novel is um, slightly counterfactual in that mm. um, the independence referendum takes place and um, Scot the, the, the Scottish people decide to become independent. Yeah. And um, I thought there's a, an ecotopian vision in a way um, included in the novel of a, a different yeah. um, Scotland in which um, there's a different place for wilderness. Yeah, yeah and, uh, uh, you know, two reasons, I suppose, during the writing of the novel or in, you know, it was in the run-up to the referendum, so... Uh, the discussions were happening every day about um, whether Scotland would vote yes or no, what the meaning of it was, um, 
all the economic arguments, all the kind of arguments of the heart. It was all going on, and it felt it was all about borders and uh, identity and complicated arguments, you know, uh, complicated discussions. And um, obviously, the Wolf Border, the title was chosen for many reasons, but um, it was possible that the border was going to take on new meaning if Scotland voted yes. And uh, Really, if wolves were ever to be reintroduced in Britain, it would have to be Scotland. You know, uh, that's the only area where really it would be viable, and not many of them. Um, so, but it, at the moment, it will not happen. Uh, and I was trying to think, okay, so if the wolves are going to be in the enclosure, uh, and then maybe they're going to be outside the enclosure, what would happen? Would there be the possibility that they could, mm. you know, repopulate Britain? And the only way, really, that it could happen would be in Scotland, and there are a few rules and regulations at the moment that won't let it happen. So, in some ways, I wanted to experiment with uh, what would happen if Scotland voted yes? What would an independent Scotland mean? Uh, that's a very interesting question, and it is a question which is not going away anytime soon, and will probably be, back, be tabled again quite soon, I think. Um, and I sort of had to get Scotland to vote yes, because certain political things needed to shift in the country for them to possibly accept free roaming wolves. So uh, that choice was made um, because, you know, as a, as a novelist does, I was just soaking up what was going on around me and it was kind of, you know, coming into the writing of the book, you know, just collect collect things as a novelist, I think, and, and sort of reconstitute it into fiction. But also uh, there were, again, ruthless decisions made about um, the sort of logistics of the book, the logistics of a wolf experiment. Mm. Um, yesterday we had quite a heated debate about um, individual decisions of human beings yeah. and um, larger structures, and I think your novel is, is great in that it brings these two together, in that it um, describes the um, importance of um, political structures as well. Yeah. Um, but I would also like to talk about the shape of um, Britain as an island, because that's quite unique. The borders are not um, not only political borders, but are also geological borders. Mm. And um, what do you make of that? I mean, um, the, there are t actually two wolf experiments described in your novel, one in Idaho that I've already mentioned, and one in Britain, and yeah. they're quite different, aren't they? Of course, yeah. I mean, uh, in theory, there is no one estate big enough in Britain at the moment to handle a wolf project, an enclosed wolf project. You need so much space. So I had to invent an estate in Cumbria, which um, it is a Cumbria of science fiction. You know, the county has expanded and an estate has been created that's large enough to host free roaming wolves that hunt and can breed. Um, but, and that seems quite grand scale for Britain. But at the same time, you know, the real reintroduction projects that are happening in North America kind of dwarf all this. We're talking proper wilderness, really. Uh, and those reintroduction projects have often been very successful. Um, so Rachel's kind of cut her teeth in North America, where it is really all going on, and has come back to Britain. It's a very different kind of project. It's a smaller project. She understands that. But it's of interest, you know, that the idea um, that after centuries, the wolf might come back to Britain somehow. So. Um, and then I think, as I mentioned yesterday, there is this this third kind of secret plan. It's not just about wolves in an enclosure. Something greater is going on. This kind of giant rich man's experiment to see, mm. to kind of play around and actually perhaps reintroduce them properly. Um, sorry, this is really spoiling the end of the novel for everyone, but if you haven't read it, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the geological borders, yeah, I mean... As a kid, I loved those relief maps, you know, the kind of jutted relief maps that you could see where the mountains were actually coming out of, of the map and the lakes were sort of sunken. And I was sort of slightly obsessed with these things and what they meant. And uh, even, if, if, even if county borders were sort of, you know, drawn on a map, the, the geology of a place will create different borders, will create a kind of natural border somehow. And really, that's how uh, wild animals, wolves, all, all animals operate. They're kind of operating with... with um, different structural maps, you know, biomass maps, you know, that's that's the way they operate. They're not going to recognise any kind of border. So even, you know, had Scotland voted 
voted for independence and, and become an independent country and the border would take on new meaning, it, that, would, that border would mean nothing to a lot of wildlife. I mean, if there was a giant fence across it, it might, but even then. Um, yeah. So that idea, you know, when we think about conservation, uh, it, we have to think about collaboration, really, because our political borders, our national borders, don't recognise often the, the wild, the kind of wildlife and how, how creatures operate. Uh, and that is a big challenge. I mentioned this yesterday. Just in terms of wolf conservation in Europe, I mean, one of the problems is is movement between countries and countries having different legal status for wolves or, or protected status or damage compensation. Um, and in some ways, uh, a, a more successful wolf program throughout Europe will require more collaboration between countries. Mm. One of the advantages of fiction to me seems to be that you can... Um actually enact such a thought experiment as um, Scotland becoming independent. Um, but then there's also a lot of non-fiction bits in your novel. You've done a lot of research, and I was wondering whether it was always clear to you that you were going to write a novel, or whether you were tempted at some point to just write a book about wolves. No, I can't write non-fiction. It's just, I just cannot, I'm too much of a flim-flam artist. I, I bastardize all facts that I get hold of, and, you know, I, I kind of, I'm always trying to find the sort of <laughs> drama around it and the, I don't know, I'm just not at all suited to non-fiction, I think. So, uh, although it's fascinating, I mean, this is one of the, the beauties and the privileges of being a novelist. You, you know, you engage with these crazy projects for sort of, you know, one, two, three, five, seven, ten years, however long it takes you mm. to become a relative fake expert in a subject in order to uh, convince your reader that you know enough about that subject in some ways, or at least some of your characters do, uh, that they will believe, you know, what they're reading on the page. And that, it was a huge challenge. You know what, I was more worried though, because I hadn't had children at that point, I was more worried about pulling off the act of writing about motherhood than I was about um, creating a wolf expert. Oh, that was very convincing. Thank you. <laughs> In some ways, it might seem easier because, you know, I'm a woman, we're human, you know, I've seen it done. I, I had seen it done at that point, my friends were doing it, but I was really worried about that. I was really worried about the kind of authenticity of experience there. Far more worried than, than you know, having read a lot of wolf facts and thinking about how kind of old-fashioned zoologists might operate or a field researcher might operate. That, in some ways, felt not easy, um, but I was less worried about it, strangely. Mm -hmm. Okay, this session is slightly shorter than the rest because we all have to catch the bus back to Munich. Um, and we would like to give all of you the opportunity to ask questions now, if you want to. Um, so we've got about 10 more minutes for questions, um, if you feel the urge to ask Sarah. Um, apart from nature, you obviously also have a lot of gender-related themes and uh, a lot of female characters and the beautiful indifference only has uh, female protagonists. So I was just wondering how you feel about uh, being a woman writer and writing in a tradition or generation of women writers, you know, apart from nature writing. Yeah, it's a um, great question. Uh, I don't feel like a woman writer, I just feel like a human writer in some ways. I recognise that historically the experiences of men and women across the world might be different. Uh, there are things to recognise politically. I'm interested in feminism, I'm interested in creating exhilarating women characters that I find have been lacking in fiction. Uh, and when you, when you come across them, it's, it's great. Um, not heroines, but and not strong women either. Just just complicated, you know, female characters with agency in in their life and work. Um, but it's difficult because you, uh, there's a kind of self awareness that's lacking for me in terms of that. I, yes, in some ways there is an agenda to create uh, women characters of interest to me and readers, um, and perhaps move into territory where you feel like you might be slightly pushing the boundaries. The Carhill and Army, a novel that I wrote explores what it might be like to be a female soldier and this is something which is relatively new within the scope of women. Women have always worked in the military but being at the front line 
is relatively new. Um, so those are areas of interest for me. I will head in those directions um, with glee. <laughs> Um, it's very exciting to, to sort of think about those things and write about them. But in some ways, I don't know. I don't know. What is it like to be inside your own body and write? I don't write as a woman writer. I just write as me. And, and, and I write about some women's issues and, and, and human issues and political issues. Um, but at the same time, it's irrelevant to my writing as much as it is very relevant. That's a terrible paradoxical answer. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Thanks. So I haven't been able to read The Wolf Border, but I'm looking forward to it more than I was before now. <laughs> And, but, and I have a moment, because it's really gripping, and, but I have a moment of um, a sort of disturbance to record, and I wonder what you make of that, because um, at the point, why does your hero, heroine have to drug the animal be, as it's going to die anyway? What kind of a pharmacological intervention is that, sort of, in a sense, removing the experience of death um, in... Is, I mean, there's, there doesn't seem to be any kind of conflict there. Mm. And um, it's, it's a kind of humanitarian yeah. action, sort of, you know, easing the pain. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, you know, is, that, isn't that, is there a kind of ethical question about that as well? Possibly, but I, I think um, much as you might work in, in that field and Rachel goes through all these procedures to kind of not habituate the wolves, to kind of prevent them coming into contact with human beings. So while they're in quarantine, they're shipped in from Romania for the, for the experiment. Uh, and she has to keep them uh, scared of humans, basically. So she goes through all these procedures of firing off fireworks to kind of keep them afraid and not, not be around humans too much. Doesn't name them, you know, tries to keep them as, as wild as possible. But at the same time, I think if you spend a long time working, and I, again, I'm not an expert, um, Helen MacDonald, where are you? Um, <laughs> I think, you know, kind of starting to feel for the animals that you work with is, is often, I think, that's the story that's told. And I think putting an animal out of its misery. All she's got are tra tranquilizers rather than a gun, you know, because she's... the. Th the idea is that they might be darted and brought back to the estate, which is rubbish. It's never going to happen. They won't be put back in the enclosure. So that's all she's got. And I think standing by and watching an animal suffer, even if you are uh, an expert in the field and you're not kind of completely disassociated from, from that suffering uh, and will feel an attachment to those animals. Um, so that's why she does it. But yeah, perhaps, other, uh, perhaps others would have stood by and done nothing. I don't know. But the, it, the character of Rachel undergoes a kind of change throughout the novel as well. In some ways, she's learning to be human uh, or more human. Uh, and, um, you know, she's, throughout the novel, she's sort of pitted against the wolves. Because wolves are very social and they have quite a complicated way of, of, uh, of being social and forming societies and packs and uh, are very successful in, some, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, the way they function. And when you first meet Rachel in the novel, she's relatively dysfunctional in her personal life and her family uh, relations are poor. So she has to sort of work on that at the same time as working on this project. And you sort of see a sort of humanising process of her throughout the book. So it seemed the right decision at the time. Um, I really enjoyed the um, depiction of the Idaho um, environment um, and you spoke yesterday about um, who owns the land and that is an issue a broader issue um, with st putting stresses on individuals and uh, and in, and ecosystems and I just wondered if you did you do any direct research of the North American um, you know local uh, net, um, indigenous peoples versus others, parks and conservation versus the need for them to exploit their own resources. Did, did you do feel yeah, like directly? Yeah, I did, I did. I, you know, I lived in America for five, six years and spent a lot of time in the Pacific Northwest. So um, I sort of visited those areas and tried to go and see the sword tooth pack a couple of times. I didn't see them. 
which is fairly usual for trying to see wolves. Um, yeah, and, and the Idaho takes up really not much room in the book at all, but, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's an area of... Uh, you could spend a lot longer in a novel you know, writing about that area because it has a very interesting kind of uh, mix of people and, uh, and the wolf projects there have been very successful, but there's an awful amount of conflict as well. And I did do the, I did do the research um, and at one point thought I could spend longer here, but it was never going to be a novel about, you know, North America. It was always going to be a novel about rewilding in Britain or wilding in Britain. Would you say that an, a forest fox is wilder than an urban fox, and what are the implications? Not a fox expert. <laughs> um, I don't know, would you say a countryside human is wilder than an urban human? I don't know. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Because context, all of a sudden you see a fox in a city and somehow like so wild because it's not in the right place somehow, or absolutely in the right place, because they do very well, but, um, yeah. Questions of wild, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> I think there's a nice point to end this conversation. Indeed. Thank you so much, Sarah, for this lovely reading. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>